Well, good afternoon, everybody, and happy mid-month, mid-September Monday to everybody out there. I hope that you guys are enjoying our incredibly beautiful New Mexico weather. And yes, I know we were wearing jackets last week and flip-flops the day before, and, but it is now settled down and it's absolutely beautiful. So I hope you all got to get outside this weekend and uh, see some of our beautiful scenery. Uh, we're excited to have you on with us today. My name is Shannon. I'm with the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber. Of Commerce, and we are continuing our series this month our culture and heritage, cultura y gerencia in our community, and what makes us uh, tick as a community and come together. And so, I'm so excited for today's show because we have an incredible group with us today. But before we get started, I do want to give a couple of shout outs to our sponsors, to the people that support us here at the Hispano um, in helping us with this webinar series this month. So, first and foremost, we always want to say thank you to our tech partners at New Mexico Tech. Uh, they have for five months been supporting these webinars and they have been supporting us with our technical needs. And so we thank them, Carlos Romero and Matt Gallegos and the whole team down at New Mexico Tech, thank you. We also wanna thank Walmart this month. Walmart is our sponsor this month. We thank them for everything they do in the community. We thank them for all their support for our small business programs here at the Hispano Chamber. And so today, guys, we have a treat for you. So I hope you guys uh, grab a lunch, a cup of coffee, whatever time of day you're watching this and sit back because we have an incredible group and I can't wait to get started. So today we are going to talk all about uh, the military community and military culture in Albuquerque and in our state. And uh, we are we are a military community. We have the, 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 the luck of having a base, not just in our city, but we have several around the state. And that really makes us unique to a lot of places and a lot of spaces in the United States. And so we thought we better go to the top today. We better get all the way to the top to get those answers and really share with us a little bit about what we may not know and what we need to know about our military. So um, I'm gonna kind of just go around in the order that we are in on the screen. And then um, what I'm gonna ask is that you guys let us know your name, who you are, what you do. And then we're gonna start kind of a conversation with some questions. We wanna do some introductions right now. So <laughs> I'm just gonna start to the right of my screen. And um, General Nava, that starts with you. Well, good morning, Shannon, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Ken Nava. I am the Adjutant General of the New Mexico National Guard. I'm uh, homegrown here from New Mexico, and uh, I'm very honored to have this position and uh, look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Uh, General Jenna Tempo. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Anthony Genetempo, but have gone by the nickname Augie uh, since I was a very, very small young lad. Uh, and I am currently the commander of the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center, which is headquartered here in Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base, uh, but have a lot of ties to a lot of other uh, states um, for this particular mission uh, that I'm in charge of with about Oh, close to, I think, 1,800 to 2,000 people overall uh, that are working on the modernization and sustainment of our nuclear enterprise. So uh, very happy to be back in Albuquerque. I started off here as a brand new second lieutenant on my first ever assignment in the United States Air Force. So uh, it's good to be back home and come full circle. Great. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Tom, you're next. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Shannon, and uh, thank you, uh, Ernie, for, uh, for hosting this and, and inviting us to participate. Um, uh, my name is Tom Berardinelli. I, uh, I go by Bird, uh, an, another Air Force uh, nickname. Um, I've, I'm a retired uh, Air Force colonel, um, but between my uh, Air Force active duty time and my civilian time in the Air Force, it's been about 40 years now. Um, and I've actually been in Albuquerque for almost 21 of those, uh, not all at the same time, but uh, spent a lot of my career um, here in Albuquerque and at, uh, at Kirtland. But uh, thank you for having us. Thank you, Tom. Steve, you're next. Hey everybody, Steve Garcia here from uh, Brycon Construction. Uh, about 18 months or so ago, I retired from the New Mexico National Guard as General Nava's Chief of Staff. And I got to now discover the best of both worlds being 
a career military guy, and now I'm working for a pretty fun company, uh, doing some business development and getting to partner with you fine folks there at the Spano Chamber. A lot of fun and games, it seems like, the last two years, but it just keeps getting better. I, I've, I've got a blessed life. Thank you, Steve. And uh, last but definitely not least, our our own commander, commander in chief, if you will, uh, Mr. Ernie Cedarbach. Well, thank you, Shannon, and uh, I'm very excited about today's webinar. And it's great to have two generals here, and uh, all the uh, things that are going on in the military that are important to New Mexico and to our country. And so we're just fortunate here in New Mexico to have some things that sometimes could be considered hidden in plain sight. Uh, because people may not know uh, how much uh, the military uh, is involved in New Mexico and uh, what they do for this state and our country. So it's an honor to be here with everybody. Thank you, Shannon. So um, we definitely have a, a bit of questions lined up, some fun stuff, but I think it would be really great to get to know everybody just a little bit. It kind of sets the tone and helps us understand um, your passion and where you're coming from when we talk about the military, which I think helps the community understand a little better. Um, so we'll just go back in a circle like we started. And I just want to kind of start um, with you, General Nava. I think, um, you know, start us off. How did you select military? How did you decide on what branch? What's your background and how you even came to this career? Thank you, Shannon. That's a great question. Um, so um, I had no aspirations of joining the military. Um, I was a college student at the University of New Mexico, uh, goofed off a little bit my first year of college, and I needed education money. And so that was my motivation. I do come from a military family, however. Uh, both of my grandfathers served in World War II. I have an uncle that, that died on Iwo Jima during World War II and received the Silver Star for his actions there. I have another uncle that died in, uh, in Vietnam in 1966. He received the Silver Star for his actions there. I have a cousin who was the first Santa Fean killed in Vietnam, uh, Francis Xavier Nava. He was killed on September 6th of 1966. There's an elementary school in Santa Fe named for him. I come from a military family, but again, I had no aspirations of joining the military. My grandfather took me to a recruiter uh, I must, I don't even remember how the discussion went, but I went to a recruiter with my grandfather and he enlisted me uh, in the New Mexico Army National Guard. Um, and that was, uh, that's the way that I got in. Uh, I found very quickly though that I was uh, natural for it and that, uh, that I liked it, I loved it. And uh, here I am 32 and a half years later uh, as the Adjutant General of the New Mexico National Guard. Well, we're, we're um, very thankful to have you on today, and we're thankful for uh, your service and everything um, that you do for our state, so thank you so much. Um, same question, uh, General Jenna Tempo, you know, what led you to the military? Well, uh, just like General Nava, I, I come from a long line of folks in the military, except I'm the first volunteer. Um, I had a grandfather who uh, served in World War I, actually. Um, my uncle, uh, my father's brother, served in World War II. He was uh, in an <clears throat> Army uh, troop transport. He was a radio operator on a troop transport in the Atlantic. And my father actually served in Korea. Uh, but I'm the first one that actually volunteered to join the military. And it's, uh, it's actually something that I've known that I've wanted to do since the eighth grade uh, when I did a career fair uh, for our middle school. Uh, and my career fair was... Air Force and I teamed up with a guy who wanted to do Army and you know 29 years later uh, he never followed through on joining the Army and here I am still plugging away at it so uh, it's been a passion of mine I've been uh, just have loved um, uh, everything having to do with airplanes and the Air Force especially the space so to actually be part of the Air Force now that we have our own separate Space Force that is just at its beginning as of its foundations. Uh, it's just really an exciting time to be part of the leadership of uh, the best Air Force in the world. Well, thank you so much. We wanna definitely hear more about that. Let's uh, move over to Tom. Tell us a little bit about how your military career got started. The, the first thing I need to say that I forgot to say before is that uh, I, uh, General Jenna Tempo is my boss. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I am his director of staff or, or director of stuff, I think. Sometimes I like to think of it. Um, but uh, so, so thank you, General Gina Tempo, for keeping me uh, um, on, on board. Um, you can stay now. 
you know, uh, I, I would just say for, for those who are wondering, you know, is, is a military career something that people who have lots of people in their family or it's a family tradition come to? Um, I had really nobody in my immediate family that was in the military. Um, I had a, a, my grandfather uh, who was in the Italian army in World War I uh, and came here right after World War I and uh, I had an uncle that was in, uh, in the army in World War II in the 3rd Division, Infantry Division at, at Anzio, um, but uh, it was not a, a part of, of, of my family's background uh, or, or, or culture. Uh, like General Genetempo, um, sort of around middle school time frame, um, I, uh, I had listened to um, some uh, a career fair and we had some military folks there and uh, I thought it sounded really cool. Um, I will tell you to the, to the day though that I, I started ROTC, I really did not know what I was getting into. Um, but uh, the, the one great thing about the military is if you don't know, uh, they will train you. Uh, they will tell you what you're getting into. Um, but uh, it, it, uh, it, it's not necessarily something um, that uh, is a tradition for everybody. Um, it, it, it wasn't for, uh, for me. Um, but uh, I, the thing that I, I think I, I liked the most about it was this idea of being part of a team uh, that I saw as a, as a winning team um, and something that was much bigger than I was. Um, and so that, that uh, continues to motivate me uh, uh, today. Thanks. Awesome, that sounds great. Uh, Steve, how about you? What was your inspiration? How did you, uh, how did you uh, become part of the military family? That is an extremely loaded question. I can answer that 10 different ways. I'll keep it quick. Yeah. <laughs> I, share, I shared the, both these generals, uh, uh, the, the way they started, at least with me. Um, I didn't do good in high school. I was a jock and I was a lady lover and I was terrible in school. So I needed money for school. So, you know, my dad, who happened to be uh, uh, active duty in the National Guard at the time, uh, offered a position for me to be a combat medic. And I said, you know, I want to be a doctor. Um, of course, I forgot that it, that took brains. I just liked the title. So I joined the guard. Uh, and then uh, it just, it's one of those things that just kind of grew on me. And I'm kind of glad it did because I would have missed out on a lot of legacy that my own family has contributed to the New Mexico National Guard. Um, and, and General Nava knows this story well. He knows it better than I do. But, you know, my grandfather was a uh, Tom Deathmarsh survivor. Uh, he was, uh, he, he was a, uh, he, he was an ex-prisoner of war in that he escaped from a prison camp during the time in the Philippines and he lived in the jungle on his own. Wow. Uh, yeah, for about, for about uh, 39, 39 months, uh, made it home, lived a good life, uh, but just for my grandpa and those wonderful men before him and with him and, uh, you know, then my dad stayed in. My dad retired as the Deputy Adjutant General for the state of New Mexico. My brother Alex, Command Sergeant Major Alex Garcia, retired from the Guard um, after 27 years. My brother Sam retired from the New Mexico National Guard, E-8 active duty, after 26 years. And then here I am. Uh, after I, I was one month, I was one month and eight days short of 34 years. Wow. And to, to this day, I still can't tell you why. It just... Uh, and it was God's plan, and I followed it, thankfully. Um, but that's the story. It's it's been a, it's been a great life, and uh, just so you all know, I'm honored to be a part of this now. Now being retired, I'm glad I can still be a part of it. I haven't been able to tell my story in a long time. That's kind of cool. It's kind of neat. Well, we want to keep your story alive, everybody's stories, because that's what really helps us as a community to understand how do we connect. You know, what are the things that we need to know? And so, uh, thank you for that, Steve. And uh, so, with that being said, I think you know one of the one of the questions that's really important is um, after kind of understanding and, and, and hearing a little bit about uh, your backgrounds, I think that there is probably. Um, 
um, maybe some misconceptions, maybe some things that we don't all understand about the military. You know, the base is right here, but sometimes they seem so far away or so separate or so secluded, and we don't know what goes on behind the walls and all that kind of fun stuff. So I think maybe uh, let's kind of tackle a little bit about what are some of those misconceptions a little bit between civilian and military life that people sometimes think, oh, well, you know, that's military or, or that's civilian life. And so um, we'll kind of mix it up here and let's kind of start with uh, General Jenna tempo on this one uh, what do you uh, what do you see as some of those misconceptions sure at first before I get started I just wanted to be said for on the record that after hearing everybody speak I'm the young one of the panel I believe is I think that's correct from what I heard everybody including Steve so I'm, I'm the young guy talking now um, you know one of the, I think the biggest misconceptions uh, especially in um, the business that I'm in, which is the business of acquisition. And, and by what I mean acquisition is we acquire the weapon systems that our war fighters need to go off and perform their mission. And in our business, the vast majority of people that work for the United States Air Force are not dressed like me. They're dressed like Bird and they're dressed like Ernie and they're dressed like Steve. Right, so I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that to work for the United States Air Force, you do not have to be in the military in the United States Air Force. And a lot of the folks that work for the Nuclear Weapons Center are not uniform wearing members. They are civilian members that look just like, you know, the three gentlemen below me there, Steve and Ernie and Tom, and they live in the community and they look just like everybody in the community. And they are a critical piece of um, making the mission that I'm responsible for uh, able to be successful. So I think to me, that's one of the, the biggest uh, things out there. It's that just because we're talking about the military, the uniform is the thing that always comes to mind. But I would wager to say 60 to 75% of the people that work in our major command, the Air Force Materiel Command, which is uh, close to about 50, maybe close to 60,000 people, 75% of them are civilians. They're not military members. So um, wow. the opportunity then is I have an organization that is mostly civilians that live in the community that the base is located in or that the mission is headquartered in. And I rely on that community to provide those people to provide the functions that I need to execute our mission. So that's a really, uh, a, you know, a food for thought for sure, because we don't think about that. And I think, you know, you again, you think military, you think they're enlisted and they're living on the base or they're working directly. And to, to hear that really. Right. Uh, and, and that we're very transit. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that we're very transit. Right. It's that, you know, the military folks, they come in for a couple of years and they leave and then they come in and then they leave. But the majority of our workforce does not do that. They, they are here to stay. Right. They are part of the community and they are performing this mission and they have been here for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. So I, I, th I think that's really interesting because it's really we're talking we, here at the chamber. Our mission is always <clears throat> business ownership, entrepreneurship, community outreach, education, things like that. And so that's really interesting. Um, you guys are probably the largest employer. So it's something to think about. You know, we don't think that way. And. So, I don't. I don't know if we are. It's either us or healthcare, but we're, we're definitely in the top three. That I will absolutely confirm for you. Uh, we may even be number two. So, uh, you know, speaking of misconceptions, General Nava, I, I think uh, there is a lot of misconceptions with the guard. People think of the guard. They think weekend warrior. They think two two weeks. Uh, what is it? Two weeks a year to one week in a month kind of thing. So, I'm positive you probably have a list. But let's talk uh, through that a little bit. What are some of the misconceptions about um, your branch? Well, I think that that's you hit hit on one. Uh, you know, we just. Uh, commemorated the 19th anniversary of the attacks uh, in 9-11, on 9-11. And that really changed the face of the National Guard and Reserves. Uh, that the, the mental model of two weeks uh, in the summer and uh, one weekend a month, that's been long gone for at least 19 years. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, one of the things that there is a misconception, again, when you look at how many people actually serve in the military that volunteer and serve in the military, it's a very small percentage. Um, when I talk about World War II in New Mexico, 
there were, we were about 500, 550,000 uh, population in the state and over 60,000 New Mexicans served in World War II, 62, 64,000. So over 10%, well over 10% of New Mexicans served in World War II. Um, today, you know, it's, it's less than 1% of people are volunteering to serve in the military. So most people may not have a firsthand knowledge um, or they may not even know anybody that's in the military. Uh, military generally has very good um, perception amongst the, the public, but they don't really know why. They just know that, hey, they're doing a lot and we should, we should like them. Um, I think one of the things that people ought to know that, that maybe they don't is that the reason we serve is to keep the peace. I don't want my kids to have to uh, go off to war. I don't want my family to have to deal with that, but, but I'm willing to do that. Uh, we, we serve to keep the peace. That's why we do what we do. And um, I think that's, that's part of it. So again, the National Guard, um, we have long legacies like Steve's family. I've known Steve's family forever. And, and, he, and it's, it's, it's in his, he has a nephew right now getting ready to deploy. It's in his family's DNA to serve our nation in this way. Just like a lot of families are, you know, maybe there's a line, long line of police officers that serve in the family. This is the way that we serve. The National Guard, um, we have a dual mission. We have a mission to our federal government uh, to deploy overseas and do the, uh, the, the bidding of our nation when it's required. But we also serve here in the state of New Mexico in times of need here. And I'm super proud to be the Adjutant General help, helping respond during this uh, COVID-19 response. Uh, the New Mexico National Guard has done incredible work throughout the entire state from everything from doing humanitarian relief efforts to, uh, to testing folks, uh, to moving specimens back and forth, to actually running tests at the scientific laboratory. The New Mexico National Guard has done an incredible job. Uh, so anyways, I, think that, I hope that helps. It, it did. It, it actually puts a lot into perspective and, uh, you know, really brings up the, the COVID conversation, if you will, <clears throat> and uh, which I think is something that's important to talk about. And, you know, I know, Tom, it, as the director of stuff, you uh, <clears throat> probably have, have been and seen a lot in the last six months. So we'll, we'll kind of uh, uh, take it over to you for this next question. But, you know, what are some of the initiatives that things that you've either had to do or change or some of the initiatives that the military has had to adjust to during this time? Yeah, that's, a, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I will tell you the, uh, the concept of telework um, is a big one. And, and uh, I was vehemently um, opposed to telework. I, I, I never liked the idea. Um, uh, if I couldn't see everybody that worked with me, um, I, I just could never accept that. Um, and uh, I, I've learned to and found that uh, um, it, it works very well. I, I, in the Nuclear Weapons Center, we are probably, we are roughly at, the, our, our part of our organization that's at Kirtland, um, about 30% of us probably are on, on site on any given day. That fluctuates a little bit. So almost 70% of our workforce now is teleworking um, and, and it's working. Now, there are some aspects of that that still concern me because when you can't, when you don't connect face to face with people, um, there's things you don't necessarily see uh, that you might um, when you when you're interacting with them uh, on the workplace. And so we are working on how do we do that. So I, I do a lot more um, for for my directorate. Uh, we do a call with everybody in the directorate, all call once a week so that I can, we can talk and share uh, information and it doesn't have to be job related, just so people can let off steam or talk about what is bothering them and what they're adjusting to. Uh, the other thing that we're, we're learning and uh, 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 General Genetempo um, ha has been uh, um, uh, leading us in, 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 in how we uh, look at this differently is our technology. Uh, we, we were very much set up to do things while we're on site on government networks in sort of this traditional way. And we're finding now that there is a lot more that we need to connect to uh, commercially. Um, and so we're trying things that I think we never ever thought we would be doing uh, before. Um, and we're learning a, a lot from it. Uh, the, the last thing I'll say about telework, though, is, is that for those that, that might think um, 
if you get to relax a little bit more, I'd say it's almost the opposite, is that uh, you sort of, the on button is almost always on. Um, and, and that's something you have to get used to uh, as well, is, is regulating yourself uh, when you're in telework. But uh, a lot of things I never thought we would do, um, we're doing and we're, and we're doing them pretty well right now. So uh, interesting that you say that because it's such a big part of the world right now that especially, um, you know, <clears throat> for some of us communities were <clears throat> are already using telework and uh, virtual type networking uh, platforms. And so it has been an adjustment for sure. Um, and speaking of adjustment, you know, one of the reasons that we had reached out to Steve to join us today is here at this Bono Chamber, uh, traditionally we've been involved in veterans and veterans affairs in, in various different forms over the years. <clears throat> we currently have a program that we're uh, putting into play and so we'll be uh, excited to get you guys more information as that comes to fruition for sure. Uh, but it involves a little bit of transition. What does that look like when you, um, you know, retire from the military or leave the military and kind of transition into civilian life. And so sometimes it's not that easy. I mean, especially for somebody that's been in the military for 30 years, so to speak. And so Steve, I really want to chat with you just for a few minutes. If you could share with us a little bit about the importance of the transition and the support. I mean, you were able to go right into a, a new career, which doesn't always happen. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of uh, leaving the military and, and if you're staying in Albuquerque or planting roots, you know, what does that look like for, for a, a person um, exiting the military? Yeah, that's, uh, for, I better say this first. It was actually an easy transition for me only because um, I, was, I was embedded in the community, so to speak, anyway, with the National Guard. We're already such a good part of the community. Um, I don't think I ever told General Nava this, but you know, the reason why I retired was because uh, the position I had before that and the other positions I had before the chief of staff job, I could get out and go do stuff and I could, he could send me on, on cool things. But as the chief man, I had to sit in my desk and hold the fort for him while he was out having all the fun. And I'm such an extrovert. He knew I couldn't sit still. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna go crazy if I gotta sit in this office. I had a beautiful office though, by the way, but no, I'm just kidding. So transitioning into, into this position with Phil, and you know, Phil was just the first, uh, and I said Brycon, Phil's the owner. Um, he was the first of a few to, to, to present me with an opportunity. And so had I not been there with Phil, I would have, it would have been even a different transition, but into a civilian personnel. And one of the jobs that General Jenna Tempo just talked about, I probably, I was, I was geared going towards Kirtland in a position. And the fact that uh, Phil offered a different, I got an opportunity to be very extroverted, obviously, as a business developer, but to go back to those community ties, you know, not just see Ernie and Jim when they had their tie on and I had my uniform on, but now I can see them, you know, face to face with their shirt instead of pass up on a, on a glass of scotch, I could enjoy it and have one with them. <laughs> and it was okay with my boss. No, um, but what, what a great transition because New Mexico is a family. And I, I, don't, I, I know General Nav agrees with me on this. Uh, being embedded, coming as a civilian, and then taking your uniform, taking your civilian clothes off and turning your uniform on, you're still a good portion of that, uh, of the community. You're still involved, and people see that. And in my role now, and you guys have seen me a lot in, in, in different places, I've been able to brag about, you know, the New Mexico National Guard because that was my life. And I'm able to share the experiences and brag about the things that they're doing to dispel that, that old notion of, of a weekend warrior, two, two, weekends, two, two weeks a year, one week in a month. It went away, like General Nava said, a long time ago. And I got to live and breathe it. I got to serve in some positions that were really, really cool in, in, in supporting domestic response here in New Mexico and throughout the national. And, and you know, I got to go to combat and uh, do a few things. But um, my transition, just because it came from New Mexico and I got to stay here my entire career and then go right into the community that I grew up in, uh, that my father grew up in. I mean, right where you guys are at, my dad, was born and raised about a block away from the Hispano Chamber building. So I, I kind of feel at home every time I go there. You guys can tell I make myself very comfortable when 
them in your building. But that's that that should be a, um, a bragging right for you because you make us feel comfortable. And um, I was just talking with one of my real close uh, uh, guard buddies, one of General Navas staff members this morning and telling him it is so refreshing to hear the last six months about how wonderful the New Mexico National Guard is doing with this COVID response because I, I, I see these guys on Facebook at Drill Weekends and all these events they're doing, you know, we can't go to them because they're, 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 it's the right thing to do. It's the responsible thing to do, but they're still out there and they're still doing it. They're still accomplishing it and not letting it slow down. And these, these men and women who are showing up, 4,000 of them on a drill weekend, remember the majority of them go right back to their jobs and, and they do it flawlessly. So I want people to know that I'm sure General Nod needs more. I'm sure he could use more, more soldiers and airmen in his ranks. Uh, but be, stay a part of that family. Be, be the, be the vecino that we're looking for, right? So we're going to uh, have Steve on to talk about that vecino a little more. <laughs> do a whole show on, on why the military and, and uh, we'll gear it towards our high school seniors who are not sure what they're going to do uh, in the future. So we should look at that in the spring because uh, this is a great group. And I think the inspiration coming from, uh, you know, retired and, and uh, directors of staff and, and generals is, is a really big deal. So we'll have to look at that. And <clears throat> so as we start to kind of wind down our time. I, I want to definitely throw uh, something out there, and I, I'd like to maybe uh, we'll start this time with uh, General Nava and, and uh, General uh, Jenna Tempo, if you can uh, follow up with it. You know, <clears throat> I think uh, being that uh, you guys, I know that General Nava is from New Mexico, and I know that uh, General Jenna Tempo has been back and forth and has ties and roots here. Tell us how Albuquerque and New Mexico differ from other states, from other places around the country when it comes to military culture. How do we as civilians um, interact with the military? What are some of the things that the military, um, you know, does with the community here, maybe doesn't do with other communities? So let's talk about the difference in the culture for Albuquerque and New Mexico versus other places around the country. Well, uh, Shannon, thanks, thanks again for the opportunity to be part of this webinar and the opportunity to answer that question. Um, most of my travel is very short in nature. And so again, maybe General uh, Jenna Tempo can talk more specifics. But what I can tell you is this, is that uh, New Mexico's hospitality, the city of Albuquerque's hospitality is known throughout the country. And so when people come to New Mexico, when military personnel come to New Mexico, that is one of the things that I consistently hear is how nice people are, how welcoming they are, how thankful they are for their service. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a general officer. I can certainly afford to pay for my meal, but I can't tell you how many times I've showed up somewhere and, uh, and enjoying a meal with a one or two other individuals and get ready to pay and somebody has bought my lunch or bought my breakfast. I can't tell you how many times that has happened. And so what I will tell you about New Mexico is that we have a lot of people. We have a lot long uh, a legacy of honor and a long uh, lineage of people that have served in the military. We have a lot of folks that are very cognizant of how important the military is to New Mexico and in converse, how important New Mexico is to the military. One of the things I love to say is that you cannot talk about New Mexico, excuse me, U.S. world, U.S. military history without including New Mexico in the conversation. You cannot include New Mexico military history without including the New Mexico National Guard in their conversation. They are inextricably linked um, and the people here know that. And so I can tell you that again, is our hospitality and the way that New Mexico, just the way New Mexicans are and the way that Albuquerqueans are, uh, that is one of the differences that I know. Uh, General Jenna Tempo, I know you've been all over, and so I'm really excited that uh, General Nava mentioned our hospitality because I was hoping you did. I was definitely going to bring it up, if not, because we are told even in, in the things that we do from uh, different conferences and conventions that come through our convention tourism department, that they literally have never had the hospitality they've had here in Albuquerque. But being that you've traveled all over, give us your perspective, and you've lived in other places, and tell us how our community differs from places around the country. Well, I, I would absolutely have to agree with uh, the assessment of hospitality. As a born and raised New York and New Jersey person, when I first came to Albuquerque as a, a very impressionable young man, 
and I ordered a burrito for the first time and the question, that eternal Albuquerque question was asked, red or green? And I said, red or green what? You know, those, those are hanging offenses in, in some parts of the country, but the nice folks of Albuquerque took it upon themselves to educate me and make me one of their own. Um, the thing that is impressive most to me about uh, New Me Albuquerque and New Mexico uh, at large is, uh, again, back to General Nava's point, the connection to world history, okay? And the ongoing connection to world history. Uh, my humble opinion is that everything that the United States is able to do and is able to accomplish is because of the strength of our military and our resolve and what we have available to us to use. And the nuclear mission is by far the most important, the protection from nuclear harm, but also the ability to project that and everything else we're able to do is connected to that. So from up north in Los Alamos to Sandia and the nuclear weapons center right here in Albuquerque to our uh, White Sands missile test range down south where we test a lot of our systems at. Um, that connection, that ongoing connection and that history all the way back uh, to the 1940s and even earlier um, is something that a lot of other parts of our country just don't have something that is readily on everybody's mind. Everybody knows about Los Alamos and its contribution. Everybody knows about White Sands and its contribution to making the world the place that it is today um, and to making our country what it is today. So that, that's the most impressive, unique thing that I've experienced in my travels. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and I think it's important that people understand that we, you know, this state, this city has that program, that military program is right here. And again, just things that over time we hope to share in partnership with the with you guys and the base and Kirtland and everybody and National Guard. We've even had uh, conversations, uh, uh, speaking of breakfast with General Nava, talking about how do we get uh, military and entrepreneurs involved. So we, there's a lot of work to be done, and we're super excited about tackling that. Um, it seems like now is the right time. Uh, COVID has opened so many uh, creative and innovative ways of thinking, and we hope to move forward with that. But before we go, I really want to talk to um, Ernie. I want to kind of bring it up to you now. You've done a few military things in the past on your own. And uh, let's talk about one a unique experience that you have had and uh, why we have been so uh, pro-veteran, pro-military um, with you being here. So we're excited to hear about it. So oh, thank you, Shannon. And, and uh, both Bird and General Jenna Tempo will know this even better. But I was I am fortunate to be an honorary base commander. And my mentor is the General uh, Jenna Tempo. It was uh, General Morris uh, before that. Um, let me just say this. For somebody that did not grow up military, that did not really uh, know much about it, other than I grew up in Los Alamos, so I knew all the history about that. We are fortunate to uh, have such a strong military and for people to give their lives and their careers and their livelihood to uh, the military. We don't know that until we really look into it. I was one of them. I was uh, fortunate, fortunate last year to go to the National Security Forum as part of my honorary base commander uh, program. And I tell you what, it is a, an awakening. So. I don't know, uh, General uh, Jenna Tempo, if you'd like to kind of rehash why that's so important for this program with our community and the bases. I think that would be a good opportunity for you to mention. Sure, you know, I, I attribute it to a, a, it's a trickle down theory, right? And it all starts with communication and it's getting people like Ernie um, from the community an in-depth experience to actually be a part of our organization and to take part in the things that our organization to do for us to in turn, um, you know, the, the tie with the Hispano Chamber of Commerce, uh, I've already, you know, Ernie came to my change of command ceremony uh, just back in June. Um, you know, he, he was there as a part of not just Albuquerque, but he was there because he's a part of our organization. Um, and, and saw that changeover. And then immediately uh, he and I exchanged numbers and, and have been talking about what can we do together to 
not only spread the mess, you know, spread the message of what I do, but spread the message of what I do and how that ties to what he does. Uh, and that it, it is a true community uh, relationship that we are trying to build and foster. And that the opportunities that we in the federal government have and the Department of the Air Force have and the Department of Energy in this area has for people of this area and to try to work with the local communities, to try to work with the state communities, to give those opportunities to our local citizens, right? To the people of New Mexico and to the people of our towns. Um, so that's really where the importance comes in of, of having someone like Ernie as closely associated with us. And we're looking to expand those opportunities with the, the 377th Air Base Wing, who was kind of like, uh, they, they're the, the commander there is the mayor of Kirtland Air Force Base, so to speak. He's the host. I'm just a tenant, right? I pay rent to live on Kirtland Air Force Base. Okay, but he has a very huge outreach with the community as well. And he's taking all of our tenant uh, organizations from all over the Department of Defense that live here and pushing us out into the community um, because we need to be a reflection of the community. We need to let the community know what we're doing in their community and how they can be a part of that in our community. So that's, uh, and, and giving Ernie an opportunity to not just see that, but then to go to the next level and to see at a national level how the military fits into our national policy, um, he can then bring that experience back and share with others and be able to draw. I always talk with my folks about being able to draw a straight line between what they do personally and what the president of the United States would like for our country, right? And if you can't draw a straight line, then let's sit down and have a conversation about that, right? To make sure that you are lined up with what each of the guidance from successive levels uh, is trying to put forward. So uh, giving Ernie that opportunity, I know he's had numerous conversations with others about what he learned at a national forum uh, and is able to bring that message back home. Well, thank you so much, uh, General, for sharing that information. And Ernie, I know he talks about it often. We got the whole rundown when he came back last year, and it was really, really exciting. What an incredible opportunity, great program um, for uh, civilians to be able to, to get a behind-the-scenes look, if you will, and, uh, and be able to uh, help to teach and educate the rest of us in, in all, of the, um, all of that information that we don't always know about or have access to or maybe don't even wonder about. So uh, we have found it uh, very enlightening to um, share that information. So we're super excited about that. And thank you again. So guys, we're going to wind down the hour with this incredible panel for all of you out there watching. Um, it is such an honor. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I have two grandfathers who served in World War II. So we also have uh, mil military, you know, running through our family history as well. And so it's su just such an honor to see it. It's an honor to be part of Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico in this community. So I uh, just wanted to, to give that um, uh, shout out there to, to all of the veterans. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, we commend you on your service and we're definitely here to support in any way we can here at the Hispano Chamber. So in closing up, I just would like to say, um, we'll just do a really quick once around. Um, we'll start with Steve and we'll just go in a circle. Um, Steve, you know, what is the one thing that you want to say to the community? Uh, just one thing um, that will um, really, remember, we're, we're, we want to tie in uh, the community to the military that we have here uh, in our state. If you have sons and daughters between the ages of 18 and probably 40, be a part of the New Mexico Army National Guard. I say Army because that's what I was. I have nothing against the Air Guard. I love them. But the Army Guard is a wonderful place for, for family, for community, and good money for college. Great, thank you, Steve. Tom, you're next. Uh, I, I guess the, the big thing I'd like to, to say is thank you. Um, uh, my, myself and my family have, uh, have always felt uh, welcome here. There's a lot of places that, uh, that we could have uh, chosen to retire and, and this is the place uh, we chose to, to, uh, to, to bed down at. And uh, because of the things that uh, General Nava and Steve spoke about in terms of the community. So thank you to the community. And I would just say that uh, there's, there's tons of opportunities at Kirtland. 
A lot of them are in the STEM areas. And I would say uh, if you're interested, uh, your kids are interested uh, in that, keep them, uh, keep them interested in STEM. Uh, keep them interested in math and science. And uh, there's, we can use them. Uh, we can use them out there. And, uh, and so I would encourage that. Great, thank you so much, Tom. And we agree on the STEM program, we agree. Uh, General Jenna Tempo. <clears throat> Well, I'm glad Mr. Bernelli mentioned that too, because that was really going to be my point, is that the opportunities that are available here for our local <clears throat> residents um, is constant, uh, and it's from any age, uh, from uh, internships that we have offered at our Air Force Research Laboratory for um, some high schools, some college internships, uh, right up until our um, just recently graduated, we call it our Palace Acquire program, where we bring people on and give them uh, a widespread taste of different types of things that they could do in service of the Department of the Air Force as a civilian member of the United States Air Force. Um, and when it all boils down to it, you know, we, we are absolutely all airmen and I would love to be any opportunity that you're able to come up with uh, that I can come out and talk about what it means to be an airman. No offense, General Nobler, Steve. Uh, in this community, I'd be more than happy to do that. I feel that that's uh, an inherent part of my job and uh, Ernie's going to help me be able to fulfill that. Well, thank you so much for that. And, you know, General Nava, um, it, I have friends who are Air National Guard, so there is two parts there. <laughs> but please, close us up. <laughs> yeah, so, so the great thing is, is I have airmen and soldiers that work for me in the New Mexico National Guard, so I don't have to pick between the Army or the Air Force in particular. Uh, I love that Steve is still out there recruiting for, uh, for the New Mexico National Guard and helping young men and women make that as a, as a possible choice for them to do. I've been very blessed by my service in the New Mexico National Guard and I intend to grow the New Mexico National Guard, both on the Army and Air side. And so I want more young New Mexicans, more young men and women from Albuquerque to have the chance to come serve on our team because we think it's pretty special. I would like to thank the Hispano Chamber of Commerce and thank the city of Albuquerque for the incredible support that you give to our military, but in particular to our New Mexico National Guard. Uh, it's a great place to live and I will be here forever. That's all I have, Shannon. We are, we are so thankful that all of you could join us today. An incredible panel. Uh, we couldn't ask for anything better. Uh, we hope to do this again in the spring. We'd love to talk to those uh, young uh, coming out of high school, uh, making decisions for the rest of their life, their future. And when you have all of these amazing stories as inspiration and encouragement, um, it sounds like we need to definitely um, talk to our uh, senior high school seniors in the spring. So I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Uh, we hope you guys have a fantastic day. We're so excited. Um, you know, uh, the weather's amazing. We encourage you guys to get out, uh, explore what we do here in New Mexico, support the uh, tourism industry, get out and do many staycations all over our state. Um, we want to make a big economic rebound, and we need all of you to get out and support our small business owners and our tourism industry. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday. Bye, everybody. And we have stopped recording. Woo! Thank you guys, that was so fun. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you guys are a lot of fun. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Don't get these all people all together in one room, Ernie. <laughs> well, you, thank you, General Nava, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to meet you. I hope we get to do it in person soon. I we know. Will. Steve, thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you, General Jenna Tempo, in a minute. <laughs> all right. Stevie G, good seeing you, man. Good, boss. Take care. See, see you later.